please take a seat. Well, today we've been thinking all about sacrifice. And sacrifice, particularly as we think about a Remembrance Day sacrifice, can be quite a somber moment. But it can also be a moment of great excitement as we think of what people have done for us, the love that they have for us, that they were willing to give up their lives so that we might have a better future. And this morning, I just want to um, kind of zoom in on two stories, well, actually three stories of sacrifice. Each of them are true. The first one was in about 2012, I think it was, in New York. A lady by the name of Suzanne Nicholson. She just got off a flight and she was going to spend some time in New York and she jumped into a taxi. I think we've got a picture of a taxi, just in case you don't know what a taxi looks like. There you go. And um, so she jumped into a taxi. Unfortunately, the taxi was hit by a lorry. It joined, in, it joined at a junction and it was hit and it was crushed. The taxi driver, he died, and so did Suzanne Nicholson. When the emergency services got to that taxi, they looked on the back seat and Suzanne was sitting in a strange position. She wasn't sitting like somebody normally would in a seat, but she was in fact leaned over and covering something on the passenger seat. This is a true story, this actually happened. As the emergency services pulled back Suzanne's body, her grandson was alive on the seat next to her. In that moment of absolute terror and fear, Suzanne loved her grandson so much that she shielded him from the impact and she took the hit. That's amazing, isn't it? That is amazing. Yeah, I'm glad the kids thought it was amazing. Adults, that's amazing, isn't it? What a great love that somebody should lay down his life or her life for a family member. That's amazing, isn't it? The second one, and apologies if you're in St. Margaret, you heard this last week. But the second story, again, is another true story. And it was recorded by a man called Ernest Gordon. Ernest Gordon fought in the British Army during World War II. And he was captured by the Japanese troops. Now, he was taken along with many other captives to a prisoner of war camp where he was forced to dig through the jungle towards India to lay down railroads. It was dubbed the Death railroad and for every mile of track that was laid it's believed that on average around 400 men died not only that but it was a brutal place to be they were treated in horrendous conditions and there were some really wicked and evil things that went on in the camp as Ernest Gordon writes and just adults if you've ever seen Bridge Over the River Kwai okay some of the the storyline has come from what Ernest has written about his experiences in the camp but he writes that they became like animals that the prisoners had the rule of the jungle he said it was the survival of the fittest and it meant that if somebody fell in the jungle and said please help they were ignored and they were left to die on the side he said it was a horrendous situation. But one man completely changed the whole thing that was going on in that camp. Not the prison officers, the prison officers were still brutal, but something happened with this one guy that we don't even know the name of. He changed the hearts of the prisoners. One day, a squad was coming back in after digging through the jungle. They'd been working hard all day and they brought in, as they were coming in, they put their shovels down and the prison officer counted the shovels. Again, this is a true story. As he counted the shovels, there was a shovel missing. Prison guard got angry. Who's taken the shovel? Step forward if you've taken the shovel. Yet no one stepped forward. Prison officer Ernest Gordon writes, he flew into a rage and he just started shouting, All die, all die. And he picked up his rifle, ready to start shooting them. And at that moment, one guy stepped forwards. It was me. I took the shovel. That guy was killed in front of his squad. And the squad took his body and they brought it back to camp. And as they got to the gates of the camp, they counted the shovels one more time. 
And you know what? They were all there. The prison officer had miscounted the shovels. And this guy, not knowing that there was a shovel, all the shovels were there, he stepped forward and he gave his life for his comrades, but in his mind as well also for the guy that took the shovel. Because he didn't know it wasn't missing. As Ernest Gordon writes, he says, the camp atmosphere completely changed. All of a sudden, people were in need and other prisoners stopped and helped. They used the, their field first aid that they knew and they bandaged wounds and they tended to each other and they sat and they talked and they got to know each other. So much so that when the Allied forces liberated that um, labour camp, they lined up all the prison um, guards in front of all the prison officers and Ernest Gordon said, we look like skeletons. You could see our bones. We were literally starving to death. And the Allied forces said, what do you want to do with the prison officers? Now it was the, the prisoners' turn to get their revenge. But what did they say? It's actually recorded by Ernest Gordon. Something along the lines of, we've had enough of hate. We want to forgive. Ernest Gordon credits that to this unknown guy who stepped forward and gave his life greater love. There's no one than this that he gave his life for his comrades. You know, there's another story, another true story. And I'll just finish with this just very, very quickly this morning. There's another story of somebody who knows you. He knows your name. He knows where you live. He knows what you like. That sounds a bit creepy, doesn't he? He knows where you live. But uh, he knows all about you. He knows what you're interested in. He knows who your family members or the adults that you live with are. Adults, he knows your desires of your heart and what you want for your young ones, but also what you want for yourself. He knows all about you. He knows all the good things about you, but he also knows all the things you'd rather nobody else knew. The wrong things that we've done. The things that we're ashamed of. The things that we're guilty of. He knows them too. And you know what? This man was willing to die in your place. You already know who it is, don't you? You're jumping ahead. Good stuff. Let me read some verses for you from Romans chapter 5. It says this in verse 6. For whilst we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one would scarcely die for a righteous person, but though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in that whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is amazing. That is absolutely amazing. So let us just unpack that a second. Could you just have the next slide, guys? That would be brilliant. You see, it starts off by saying, but God. But God. And when, you've got to love a but in the Bible, okay? Because it means something good's coming. It's talked just before it about some of those experiences and some of those stories that we've seen. Suzanne Nicholson, an amazing hero who gave her life for her grandson so that today her grandson could live. And this unnamed man in the prison who gave his life willingly so that the rest of the guys could go free. Ernest Gordon could write about the story. He's alive because this man took his place. He was willing to die for other people. But you know, that word but changes what we've just read in the verses before. It says that for us today, you might be saying, would I do that? Yeah? Would I be willing to do that? Would I be willing to stand up and admit to stealing a shovel that I didn't steal? All that kind of stuff. Because for us as, as humans, we want to look at conditions. We want to say, well, I'll do it, but only if this happens. Do you notice that in the verses here in Romans, it says that very rarely would somebody die for a, a righteous man. Although some, for a good one, someone might possibly even dare to die. Do you notice that in Romans there, Paul doesn't write, very rarely would anybody die for a horrible person who doesn't like you. Yeah, it's kind of taken as a given, isn't it? That as humans, we say, well, I'll only die for the people who like me. I'll only die for the people that I love, for my family members. I'll only, not only just die, but I'll only give. Sacrificially, I'll give my sweets to my brother, but only if he'll lend me his toys. Yeah, 
we look for conditions all the time and say, I'll only give if I get something back. I'll only give if I think it's worthwhile. But then this verse says, but God. You see, this is different. It means that there's something greater that's coming in the following few words. And it says this, but God shows, or in the NIV it says demonstrates. And what's really interesting about this is that if I asked you, do you like Liverpool Football Club? Is that contentious? Is that going to split the room? Yeah? Uh, okay, Sam's like this, wagging his finger. Okay, if I like Everton Football Club as well, or Manchester United, oh no, I've got it. Okay, but if you follow that team, then I'm going to ask you to show it. And you'd show me by getting out your football kit. Or you'd show me about getting out the music CDs or the music artists that you like. Yeah, You'd show me that you love those things by what you do. And look at this. But God shows. God's done something. He's done something to show how much he loves each and every one of us. He's acted. You see, God is not distant. He's not irrelevant. He's not some kind of dusty old history or mythical figure. No, God is alive today. And he's active and he's powerful and he cares for each one of us. He's done something because he loves us and he doesn't want to see us lost from him. God is powerful and alive. He's active and he's involved in our lives today. You see, God shows his own love for us. In the NIV, it adds in that word own, yeah? As he shows his love for us, he shows his own love for us. It's a unique love. It's a love like none other. It's not based on conditions. You might say to me, Josh, how could God love me because of the things I've done? How could God love me because, you know, this happened in the past or, or even as a Christian, I, I've trusted in Jesus and yet still I let him down. This morning, I was just thinking, just even over the last 24 hours, of the things that I've done, and I was like, Lord, how could you love me? But it's a unique love. It's a love like none other that you'll find. There's no conditions. You don't even have to earn this love. In fact, you can't earn this love. There's nothing that you can do that will ever make God love you more. There's nothing that you can do to ever to secure in things that you do as if you can present them and say, God, but I gave money to charity or I turned up to church or I went to boys' brigade and girls' brigade and I tried to be as nice as I could. God would say, all those things are great, but I loved you anyway. I've always loved you. In fact, I love you so much that I was willing to show this unique love to you. Kids, this is available for you this morning. But adults, this is available for you as well. God loves you. Whoever you are. Whatever your background is. However far um, you think you are from God. Whatever you've done in the past. But whatever good things you think you can present. God's going to say, I, I loved you anyway. But God shows his own love for us in this. Listen to this. That whilst we were still sinners, oops, sinners. You see, this is the amazing news of the Christian faith. This is the amazing news of this book here. That we could never ever earn our way into God's favour. In fact, the wrong things that we've done mean that we're separated from God. And if we die in our sin... Those wrong things, that disobedience of saying, God, I don't, I don't want to know you. I want to live my own life. Even just one hint of that in our lives means that we're a sinner. and means that when we die, we're separated from him forever. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. That whilst we were still in the mess, whilst we were still sinners... You know, coming here to church doesn't mean that you have to have your life in order. It means that you come in messy... Because God loves you anyway. And he loves you so much that he doesn't want you to see you to carry on in that mess. He doesn't want to see you carry on as a sinner in life. But he wants you to carry on in trusting in him. And carry on your life as you rest upon what he's done for you. 
and say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry for what I've done. Please forgive me. And he finishes off by doing this. But God shows his love for us in this. That whilst we were still sinners, Christ died for us. A sacrifice has been made. Jesus stepped forward and he said, I see Josh's anger. I see Josh's hatred. I see Josh's lust. I see Josh's pride. I see Josh's greed. By the way, I hope you're putting your own name where it says Josh, okay? I can't say everyone's name, otherwise we'll be here all morning. But I see your sin. And in fact, I'm going to take your sin. And as I hang upon the cross, I'm going to take the punishment that your sin deserves. And you're not going to wear your sin anymore. But in the Bible it says we're going to be clothed in righteousness. What does that mean? It means that when God looks at us, if we've trusted in Jesus, and he doesn't see the sin in our lives, and say, you're going to be cast off from me. But he actually looks at us, and he sees what Jesus has done upon the cross. And that righteous means to be made right with God. That God says, come home. Come and be with me for all eternity. You see, for those who trust in Jesus, there is hope beyond this life. But not only that, there's hope today. As we live as forgiven people, knowing that God loves us so much that he was willing to come and pay the price for us. And so, as we think about that today, living in the hope, but also knowing that there's an eternal hope to come as we trust in Jesus. Can I ask you this question? You might be sitting there saying, that sounds really good. So how do I get this hope? Guys, I just wonder, can you play that short clip? It's a clip that you know. It's on OBS. It might take forever to come up. But this is a clip that you've probably seen before. And the words sound very, very... But you hear that phrase that he said, greater love has no man than this, that he be willing to lay down his life for his friends. You see, that is actually taken right from the Bible. In fact, that's Jesus' words. And he says this in John chapter 15, verse 13, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And as we think about that question, how can we have this love in our lives? How can we accept Jesus and know what it is to be forgiven by him? Well, listen to what he says next. He says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Maybe this morning, the first step for you is to say, Lord Jesus, I'm sorry for what I've done. I'm sorry for my sin. I believe that on the cross, you came and took my sin, that you defeated it, and that you're offering me forgiveness today. You see, Jesus didn't just go to the cross and die, and that's the end of the story. But on the third day, he rose again, and he's alive today. 
And he's asking you, are you willing to trust in me? Are you willing to follow after me and do what I command? Because if you do, you'll find forgiveness and you'll find eternal life. Kids, big kids are hard. That's the rest of us, by the way. Are you willing to trust in Jesus today? He's paid the ultimate price for you. He's given his life because he loves you. Will you trust in him? Will you ask him for forgiveness? Will you know what it is to be loved by the almighty God? If you'd like to do that this morning, there's no set words. There's no kind of uh, hoops that you need to jump through or classes that you need to join. That's for you to personally pray, maybe for the very first time in your lives and say, Lord Jesus, thank you for what you've done. I want to follow after you. Or maybe this morning you're just saying, you know what, I want to know more about that. And please come and find us later. We'd love to talk to you about what it means to trust in Jesus and to have that forgiveness. There's a great price that's being paid for you. He's asking you now, are you willing to trust me with your life and follow after me? Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for the sacrifice that you've poured out for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you that even now, at any minute, you could have stopped the agony of the cross. You didn't. You went through it for us because you love us so much. Lord, you see our sin and you don't want us to carry on in our sin because you know that our sin equals death, separation from you forever. So Lord Jesus, you came for us and you hung on that, pla- on that cross in our place and you bore the wrath and the punishment that we deserved and you did it all because of love. Lord, we thank you so much for your love. For those of us who are Christians this morning, we just worship you and praise you. We lift you high once again. And and Lord, thank you just doesn't seem enough. But Lord, we thank you so much for what you've done for us. We thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have in these days, but also on into eternity as well. That we have nothing to fear because you've forgiven us. You've paid our price. You've been our sacrifice. Lord, for those of us who've not yet trusted in you, Lord, if you're staring our hearts, Lord, would you move us? Would you lead us? Would you direct us? Holy Spirit, would you, would you show us what it is to trust in you and how trustworthy you truly are? And Lord, would we know with absolute certainty that our days are safe in your hands, our sacrificial lamb, our Lord, our God, our King and our friend. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to stand and we're going to sing to close, um, and then I think.